Hello, welcome to another episode of Campaigniacs, the post media uh, uh, broadcast that we're uh, trying to do this uh, particular election campaign. I am Murray Mandrick, and with me, as usual, is Arthur White Crummy from the Leader Post, who's covering the election for post media, and a very special guest. Those of you who've watched the briefings on COVID 19 will know this young lady very well because she asks all the miserable questions that the politician squirm. We can become quite famous for that, Steph. Stephanie Taylor from Canadian Press. Thank you so much for joining us, Steph. Thanks. Uh, it's great. And of course, Steph is covering the campaign. Uh, I'll, I'll get to sort of the campaign events very quickly, but I, I really want to get right to the serious issue of Premier Scott Moe and his statement yesterday regarding his 1997 traffic accident uh, that caused a fatality, something that we've all known about, something that he's spoken publicly about, but something that maybe for political reasons, maybe otherwise, is uh, uh, rearing its head. Certainly one reason it's uh, rearing its head right now is because the son of the of the victim in the crash uh, is speaking out. And Stephanie, you've talked to him. Can you tell us what he said and, and what your thoughts are in terms of what I thought was a pretty moving statement on uh, on the whole ins on the whole incident. This is the first time that I believe, and Murray, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we've heard from uh, we've you. heard from the family of the victim. Um, her name is Joanne Blog, and I, I mean, talking mm -hmm. to Steve as well as talking to Dan, who is Steve's half brother, who also lost his mother in this. They're grieving. They're emotional. They said that. Um, now that, and of course, a little background to this is that they say that they are only learning about Scott Moe's identity for the first time, which I think a lot of people find, in, including it seems like the premier himself or the Saskatchewan party leader himself, who seemed to not be able to provide any kind of an explanation as to how that can happen over so much time, over just the fact that they all were living in this small section of the province at the same time. But they both said that this accident might as well have happened yesterday morning. It's really just ripped open um, old wounds. It's incredibly painful. It's incredibly personal. They are feeling a range of emotions. And I think their main point is that they have a lot of questions um, that they want answered. Why did this happen? How did this happen? They, I think, are looking for some pretty granular answers as to what happened in the sequence of event mm. that May morning back in 1997. And I, I think political campaigns, it seems that they, they anticipate when the opposition parties pull up something that their candidate has said in the past, the previous social media post. But I think the fact that her family is now speaking out and coming forward and putting questions to Scott Moe, wasn't something they necessarily anticipated. And I, and I think you saw that a little bit in how Mo answered the question yesterday. I mean, yesterday he was making a campaign announcement that was a, a good news announcement. It's, it's more funding for autism, but it, it felt that there was this cloud of, um, th this cloud that just kind of hung over it because of the very pointed questions the family is now putting to him and the fact that they are, are once again kind of, you know, re-going through some grief and, and putting that on display. That, that, it, it, there's so many elements to this story. And, and I, I'm just going to pull Arthur into this conversation a bit because I think you guys were both there during the announcement yesterday, if I remember right, Arthur. Uh, I, I was I not there, no. Oh, you were not there. I apologize. No. Uh, so maybe I will direct it. This, uh, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. It wasn't Saskatoon. My apologies. Uh, so I'll kind of direct this to Steph more than, than anyone. I guess the political implications is something that we have to deal with in terms of this campaign. Um, I think you very much outlined that there is a sincere grieving process from the sons involved. And uh, we have to just absolutely respect that. And, and it, as you say, whether it's 23 years later or not, it's still a process that they have to go through and deal with. And in terms of the legitimacy of, of the issue of where, how or where they did not know, maybe that's just the reality of, of the situation. I, I truly don't know and I can't say or criticize. But from the campaign standpoint, 
uh, and I guess either one of you can answer that, can answer this. Is it a bit of a bombshell or is this something that's going to uh, be a story on a campaign and then we're going to move on to, to something else? Because it has been lingering and there are people, uh, it seems, that are very much willing to make political hay out of this particular issue. So I, I guess I will ask you about that, Arthur. Do you see it as, as something that's a bit of a political bombshell or? Well, I guess the big question is whether these unanswered questions that people still have about oh, we do have a cameo. Yeah, we do have a, our, our usual we have a cameo from Pete. Yeah. Pete. Thank you. It's okay, uh, Steph. It's okay. Pete. Sorry, Arthur. Just go ahead. Yeah. Well, you have to, to me, the big question is to what extent these unanswered questions that the family still has about the day of the accident continue to uh, get answered on the campaign trail or whether that's something that's worked out personally between the family and the Saskatchewan party leader. There's a lot that they're still wanting to hear about. There's a lot of answers that they still want to have. Uh, is this something that happens in private or is this something that happens in public? And to what extent do the other parties try to keep the issue going? So far, it seems as though the NDP has been taking a step back and letting this work itself out through the media and through the family. Uh, the Buffalo Party does seem to have had perhaps involvement. I've seen uh, clearly that the account that was posting uh, the uh, the old news article publicly does seem to be Buffalo Party affiliated, so it's interesting to ask whether they might continue to try to keep this in the news. And, and that's an interesting uh, question but, itself, because we don't know if they're affiliated. We know that somebody mm -hmm. potentially slapped a logo on them. Uh, mm -hmm. They may be Buffalo Party supporters and trying to be helper cats, or in this case, helper dogs. Uh, thank you, Pete, for your appearance. Uh, but it, it uh, might be a situation where somebody is just making menace with this situation because they have their own axe to grind, because they think they're being uh, politically helpful. Help us a bit here, Steph. How did this come to light to the family? They say they saw it on uh, social media. They were alerted to it on social media or someone alerted them. Can you, can you, can you enlighten us any? Yes. Yeah, so last week, anyone I think who has been following the campaign a bit closely or been on Twitter saw that there was a, a Twitter account I'm not sure their affiliation, but that they had posted a screenshot of this 1997 Shelbert Chronicle article. It shows uh, a photo from the scene. It names one of the sons. It names Joanne. It names Scott Moe and, uh, uh, and was circulating on social media. And this post is really, this, this is what grabbed the attention of the family. Um, and this is kind of where that connection happened. So I don't think it's a coincidence the fact that this is coming up during election time. The son and the family have uh, said that there's no political affiliation, there's no political motivation in them sharing their story. It's simply about talking about what impact this has had on their life and talking about their grief and talking about who their mother was as a person and a human being and someone who was valued. I think in terms of is this a bombshell or not, I'm not sure how to characterize it at this point. I mean, there's lots of chatter still on social media, but I think the question, one of the questions is how much does that make its way to the campaign trail? Like how much traction does that actually yeah. receive in the wider public? But I think this coming out when it did certainly presented a challenge for Scott Moe personally, for those around him. You could see yesterday in his answer, it was emotional. And someone mentioned to me, you know, the moment he kind of stepped in front of the microphone, it seemed a bit off, right? This is a good news announcement. It's more money for autism funding. But it, it so so I think one of the challenges the campaign would have to overcome is the ability to kind of, you know, just get back to that campaign level energy. It's not like he's going to be able to get a day off. Uh, it's not like he's going to be able to, you know, sit at home and, and rest with, you know, the people around him personally in his community to kind of deal with this. And because I do want to acknowledge that, you know, there's a family that is grieving and learning about this for the first time. But, you know, this is something also highly personal and, and intensely private that is now, um, you know, coming coming on the public record again. So I, I think one of the challenges is for Scott Mo personally to be able to deal with something like this 
on top of keeping up with the pace of the campaign without it necessarily letting it bleed into um, other announcements or um, the ability to just yeah. kind of that, that, carry something... that excitement. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and it leads to something that I find off-putting, disturbing, even downright maddening, is I think there has been a level of sophistication to the social media posts. I know I was blocked from seeing it. Why would anybody who I don't know block me from seeing a social media post? I know why a lot of people uh, don't don't want my stuff to, or for me to see stuff, because they don't want me reporting on it. But I think I and other reporters were, were were blocked. And usually when that happens, specific to the social media post, they have a sophisticated reason for doing that. They want to create chatter uh, isolated from the conversations in the media and, and, and such. And I think that this very much did that. And I find that a little bothersome in terms of this. Now, this has nothing to do with the family again. And what I think would be the legitimate grief, if anything, uh, I, I think that maybe somebody sees this as an effective tool to uh, be inter uh, to be interlopers in a campaign and, and maybe do something uh, that they think is productive. Uh, I guess one thing that uh, uh, I'm kind of curious about, guys, is whether it will be productive or whether, in some ways, this because of the way Scott Mo handled it, and he handled it as you say, Stephanie, very naturally. Um, it might even create some sympathy for a situation that I think in life that he struggled with, and I guess we can all relate to situations in our life where something happened to us that we wish we handled better, that we wish didn't happen, but we now have to account for. And, you know, is it possible that, that there's sort of a rebound effect and people see the way Scott Mo handled it and are even more sympathetic for him as leader? I'm not sure. And I think um, it's a bit dangerous territory to tread on because you are talking about someone who lost their life. You're talking oh, about absolutely. a family that is, um, you know, having to come with it. So I'm not sure how much any campaign necessarily wants to be talking about this because they know that whatever words they say are going to be scrutinized and going to be felt by people who are intensely close to this tragedy. And so to Arthur's point, um, you know, there, there are definitely posts and, and people talking about this from anonymous Twitter accounts and from certain blogs, but I, I don't know if like a mainstream, you know, political party like the NDP would dare touch this just out of concern for how this is going to be viewed as possibly distasteful, opportunistic, and I don't know what the ramifications are going to be, if there are going to be any for Mo's campaign. Uh, you know, I don't know how much he's going to want to talk about it. You know, I think it's worth mentioning he only spoke about it yesterday because he was asked one question by a reporter. I don't know how much reporters are going to continue to ask about this unless mm -hmm. we find out the facts Something of the more, situation, yeah. unless we found out the facts of the situation changed. I mean, people chattering and, and throwing theories out um, online is very different than, you know, necessarily asking legitimate questions. I, I think there's important differentiation to make there. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how much what we've learned from the family is going to change how people have perceived Scott Moe's involvement because he has spoken about it for a few years now. Yeah. It, as fascinating as this is, and I think you're right, it, it, it's, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how this particular issue plays out in, um, uh, in, in the course of this campaign. But we still have the rest of the campaign to talk about, and Lord knows there's lots to talk about. Arthur, can you believe how much they're actually promising? Uh, uh, thank you it's yesterday. It's a lot I, of money. I, yes, it's a lot. Of, I, I actually totaled it because you've been keeping a running total and sort of using your figures, and I had no idea. That, mm -hmm. that both sides were actually spending uh, as much. I, I forgot how much the NDP had uh, promised pre-campaign uh, to spend on various issues. And uh, I'm absolutely floored by the government's, uh, the South Party government's attempt to match it. Is that starting to resonate? I, I won't go through the whole thing, but my goodness, we're talking literally hundreds of millions leading into billions of dollars right now in terms of promises in a province where we already got a 2.1% billion dollar deficit this year and a 24 million dollar public debt does that not register with people out there um 
Well, I think what the SAS party has done with these announcements and the argument that they're going to be able to make is that all of these measures are time limited, right? So we have a one year rebate on SAS power bills. We have a two year freeze on on small business taxes. We have a, I believe, two year tax rebate for home renovations. All of those things snap back before their four year schedule to balance the budget. Whereas they're gonna continue to attack the NDP as pricing expensive ongoing spending. Uh, that's I think the distinction they're gonna make, whether people are gonna be able to see that nuance is a different question. Um, I think this will be a major issue of the campaign. I think that the SAS party is gonna continue to attack the NDP as, as you know, being kind of reckless spenders, whether the NDP is going to be able to turn that around on the SAS party and make them look hypocritical is in this battle right now. Well, who's losing the battle right now is the taxpayers, because sooner or later, we're all going to have to pay for for this one way or the other. And history tells me that whatever benefit you get from any kind of government program, it surely isn't enough for what comes after we overspend is uh, uh, we allow our governments to overspend and we are faced with situations and uh, financing budgets where we're basically living off our credit cards quite literally uh, as taxpayers and, and financing public debt. Um, in that sense though, does the SAS party have ample cover Arthur for, uh, the ND, uh, for their own promises given how large the NDP promises truly are? Uh, I, I get that oppositions always promise more, and I get, as we've talked about in this prod podcast, that given the unlikelihood of the NDP actually winning, they can afford to promise a lot more. <laughs> but are we going to be getting caught into a trap as taxpayers where we're going to be stuck with a government and a government that made a lot of promises during uh, the campaign that is just going to add to public debt and is really going to throw off that agenda of hopefully balancing the budget in G four years, maybe? I've never seen a campaign where the promise is maybe we'll balance in four years. Again, it depends on whether they stick to the schedule that they've set out with a lot of these promises and whether we've seen the end of this uh, of of this game of you know upping the ante on affordability promises. Do these actually expire when the SAS party says that or they're going to? Really, what's more uncertain is the state of the economy and the revenue forecast that the government has set out in their budget and their Q1 update. I mean, they can cancel those expenditures, but they can't control the price of oil and they can't control the rate of growth of the economy to the same extent. So really the question is, do they earn the revenues that they say they're going to earn? And uh, what do they do if they don't? We don't okay. have a clear answer from Scott Moe about whether his preference is to extend the runway on that back to balance plan or whether he would cut like the NDP says he will. And that ambiguity allows the NDP to continue to raise fears and to raise concerns about Scott Moe's hidden agenda. I'm going to bring you in here, Steph, because people may not, not fully understand the nature of your job, but is the correspondent for this province for Canadian <laughs> press, you get to do all the big economy stories and you get to do the stories from 30,000 feet in, in, in the air. So you, you probably have as good a working knowledge as I do about, about sort of how things affect the Saskatchewan economy. Is there something that you're seeing right now in terms of the prom promises made by either parties that are going to do what politicians always say they do when they make government promises, which is basically make them because they frame them as government stimulus is something that'll get the economy going. Um, I look at a lot of these rebates going on, and from what I see, I don't see a lot of them that are actually anything other than something that's going to benefit me rather than the economy as a whole. Is there a sense of that in the public right now? Or do you see things that I'm missing right now where, oh, yeah, OK, that might actually be something that's going to actually help us move forward in this pandemic and, 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 and uh, actually uh, revive an economy that actually is pretty mortified at this point? One of the questions I have is hearing both parties come out with all of these spending promises is what happens if things go off course? What happens if there is another lockdown? And so within the wider public, I don't know 
how seriously people would necessarily be taking these promises. And I, I mean, people might always be a little bit skeptical about what comes out on a campaign trail versus what's in a throne speech and what happens, you know, when the party gets into government. But uh, I think, you know, people now have a lived experience of what it's like to kind of have their lives upended, maybe lose their job, have to work from home, cancel travel plans, all of that. So this idea that both parties are making these big commitments that are multi years into the future. Uh, one of the questions I have is, is, are, do people truly believe that or are people like well we'll see what happens with the pandemic because um you, you know i think it's worth mentioning that the SAS party's four-year plan to get back to balance is constructed on the assumption that we do not have a repeat of march mm -hmm. that if things continue to go you know well you know we knock on wood don't see major uh, major spread of covid19 if we don't see, if we if we continue to see a number of people, you know, working in the job market, but it's just unclear to me from both sides what the level of flexibility would be on these programs. You know, four years ago when the Saskatchewan party was under the leadership of Brad Wall, it seemed that this, it was a very regimented march towards a back to balance plan. And we saw the SAS party this year have to kind of yank the budget away i think the day before it was supposed to come down two days it was supposed it's a to lot come down. less regimented right now isn't it yeah <laughs> yeah so so I, I wonder in the wider public like how seriously people are taking these promises or or they might like the fact that they're getting a tax credit or they think that yeah you know we need to hire a ton more doctors and nurses but it, it's hard to imagine what's going to happen in six months from now let alone in three years from some now years from some now uh years where which is when some of these promises this are kind of, they, they come to fruition. So I think there's a grain of, yeah, everyone might be taking this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Right. And it's, it's also worth mentioning that the, the, some of the programs framed as a stimulus, they seem to be coming out um, on a line of thinking where is if you save people money, they're going to go spend that and put that back in the economy. And I don't necessarily know, if that's true, because a lot of people, if there's jobs and a job uncertainty, people are just going out for dinner less. They might be kind of counting their pennies a bit more. So if you save them, you know, six, seven bucks a month for the next year on their power bills, I don't know what they're going to do with that money. Or if you save them two grand because they took out, you know, they opted for a tax credit to renovate their home. So they're going to spend that saving because they're nervous about what might happen in the future or if they're actually going to go and spend that our next segment arthur you know, we'll have to close off here because we're going to get the whole but uh our next segment of the campaign x in the, this podcast is on the economy do you have any final thoughts in terms of what you're hearing on the campaign trail arthur related to uh what people are thinking and how that might be affecting their vote right now well, I, I would agree with Steph that there's a lot of uncertainty about whether uh, these affordability promises are really being correctly framed as, you know, stimulus measures or whether they're just, you know, ways of of, of sending money to voters at the most politically opportune time. And uh, as we go into my next segment, uh, the professor that I spoke to, uh, Joel Bruno, made precisely that comment that 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 these measures, particularly the ones that we've heard from the SAS party, and he was speaking before they made their small business tax cut um, tax cut promise, do seem to be pocketbook issues more than stimulus uh, uh, moves. So we talk about that to some extent. We also talk about uh, the grand debate between austerity and uh, deficit. What should we really be more worried about during this campaign? And what will voters be more worried about? Well, let's move forward and, and hear that second segment because it, it looks like it could be really interesting. Arthur, uh, Stephanie, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. Good luck on the campaign trail. Next week, the debate, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, that will be it from us from this week, and stay tuned for the next half of this segment. Thanks. Thanks so much, Murray. Thanks, Murray. Hi, everyone. This is... Once again, Arthur White Crummy uh, from the Campaniacs podcast of the Regina Leader Post and the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. Today, we're uh, launching our segment two to talk about the economy, one of the perennial uh, top issues of concern for voters in 
every election cycle, but a little bit different this year in the midst of a pandemic. So today we're here with uh, Joel Bruno, who is the department head of the economics department at the University of Saskatchewan, and with Sean Moan, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nine Mile Legacy Brewery in Saskatoon. So I'm just going to reach out to you guys to tell me, uh, give me a quick introduction about uh, who you are and uh, kind of uh, what you might be able to bring to this conversation. So let's start with Joel. Okay, so I'm department head. I'm an associate professor in economics. My research focus and teaching focus is international trade, environmental economics. So what I'm going to hopefully bring to the table here is uh, insight into some of the economics, some the way that economists think about the economy and elections and election policies and how we evaluate those things. Got it. And Sean? Yeah, Sean Mullen, uh, CEO and co-founder of Nine Mile Legacy Brewing. Um, well, I, along with my uh, best friend Garrett Peterson, started up Nine Mile in uh, 2015. We've been going for about five and a half years, and we've uh, been a nano brewery for a bulk of that existence in Riversdale, and uh, are just adding a production facility, uh, just about to commission it actually, uh, with uh, canning line and that sort of thing. What I bring to the table, that's a question I ask myself every morning, Arthur, but with this, I think our business is uniquely um, part of the ag value uh, chain in the province as a craft brewer. And we're also intimately connected with uh, food and beverage and the hospitality sector, which has been just gut punched uh, through the pandemic. And so I think I can bring some tales from the street. I think I can talk a little bit about our journey through the pandemic and what it was like to keep the band together, um, reimagine your business and um, proceed with an expansion despite a pandemic. And, and maybe there's some lessons in that for how we move forward beyond this. Well, that's exactly where I'd like to start, Sean. So sure. could you tell me uh, from March on the way <laughs> that the pandemic and the business restrictions put in place by the government changed the way that you do things at Nine Mile Legacy? Oh man, what a question. Uh, it, and it feels like ancient history, doesn't it? Like it, it, time just took on a whole new meaning in COVID. But um, the, 2020 was queuing up very uh, positively for us. We had our uh, expansion project um, queued up with uh, investment and financing already arranged. We'd had a couple of really significant marketing initiatives uh, in supporting the Junos uh, in Saskatoon and, and doing a special right. beer with the Blades, getting ready for a long playoff run by the Saskatoon Blades. And then uh, the middle of March hits. And, uh, you know, I, I remember watching uh, a Utah Jazz basketball game when, when Rudy Gobert uh, is infected and the league shuts down. And it felt like it was a domino effect across the world with significant events uh, shutting down. And we were no exception. Um, you know, that, that weekend we closed our tap room. Uh, March 16th, uh, the uh, public health order prohibited uh, bars and restaurants from operating on site. Uh, March 16th, for those who are uninitiated, is St. Patrick's Day Eve. It's like Christmas Day for a brewery. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, our, our main channels were, were cut off. And, and so we, we, as a small brewery, we principally sold our um, beer in the tap room. Um, and in draft uh, to a number of bars and restaurants around the city. And, and so about 85, 90% of our sales channels were uh, made invisible overnight. And so that left us with a team of about uh, 14 people. Um, we had a bunch of beer. We had just started bottling. Uh, last year we started, we onboarded an automated uh, bottler. Um, we had our bottles and we didn't have a heck of a lot else. And so what we ended up doing um, we uh, leaned into online sales and home delivery. We had to get that set up in, in, a, in the through the course of a few weeks. And we worked with uh, Zoo uh, Communications in Saskatoon to help us design that beta tested website, which we're still using today and, and looking forward to growing with them. Uh, we were driving beer to people's homes, making sure that they were comfortable and happy. And uh, we were surviving it all together, you know, and I, I think that was a story that played out all across the province. People ask us why we didn't, uh, you know, look to become more of a wholesale business at that point and, and sell our beer to retailers or to other home distribution companies. The short answer to that is we needed to protect our people. And so to do that, we needed to maintain high margin sales and create sales channels. And so we've powered through the period. Um, I, we've, we've slowly clawed our way back over the last few months and um, you know it, it worked our way out of uh, wage subsidy eligibility is uh, kind of the new way we think about things now in the business sector 
Um, but, you know, really proud of my team for thinking through it and uh, reacting to a public health crisis and also responding to several of the restrictions that were placed. So that's kind now, of a short sketch. Of course, we're here to talk about politics. And, and, yep. and, and I'd like to ask you uh, how you would assess the government's performance in being there to support businesses like yours? Were the programs that the provincial government mm -hmm. put into place at all helpful for you? Yeah, we made use of them for sure. Um, the, the, the one that we made use of was the, uh, the provincial small business grant program, which I thought was really effective and it was issued twice. So in, in uh, cumulative effect, it was uh, about $10,000. Um, you know, it was, there, there was an absence for a period of time where uh, you know, it was a, a number of businesses were needing to change significantly. Um, they weren't employing people because a lot of people had been laid off at that point. So things like the wage subsidy were fine in theory, but they weren't in practicality. And I do think the provincial government stepped up in a way that allowed people some uh, some kind of seed money to change. And we use that money for our web store. So, you know, it's it's not it wasn't the panacea, but it was something that allowed us to continue to step forward. Okay. Joel, I'd like to zoom out a bit now and go to you. Uh, ask what we're seeing in the data in terms of the kind of devastation that this pandemic has wreaked on the province and to what extent we're succeeding in bouncing back from it. So if you go back to March, the way that uh, Sean had talked about, unemployment rates a year ago at this time were probably, I think they were uh, about 8%. They had fallen through the autumn. Um, I think we're about 7%. And then we hit March and April and those unemployment rates rose to 12.9, 13%. Higher, obviously, in certain sectors. Uh, less of a shock in, in some of those sectors. But almost essentially a doubling of the unemployment rate within about a period of a month. And then slowly those unemployment rates have been starting to decrease. I think now we're at about 8 Employment, uh, retail sales relative to a year ago or back actually at the uh, uh, a year ago's level, but compared to March, it's up significantly. So what we saw was a way in which Sean described this as this massive shock, big adjustments really quickly, and then trying to work your way out of it. And that's what the economy has been doing in general. Now, someone like me is, I never really took a hit. I, I was working all the way through this. I just did it from home. And so there were parts of this economy that were able to underpin uh, the kind of activities that Sean might have, which took a really thumping, but there was still income being generated by other sectors of the economy. And so when he was able to sort of retool a little bit, at least there was some income there to, to, to tap in and, and, and to allow Sean to sort of like, try, you know, he's not running out of this, he's you know, slowly climbing out of this. And that's where I think where the province is now significantly better than we were in March and April, not near where we were last year. And so we've got a ways to go, but it's slowing down. It's, it's you know, getting out of the deepest part of the pit, you know, you might be able to do that quickly, but getting back to a period in which people think is, you know, but we're back to normal, that's going to take a year to two years. I, I, we're already hearing policies and proposals from the parties that they're framing as a way to further stimulate the to further fuel the economic recovery and i'm wondering joel to what extent can a provincial government even play a role in this are we mostly at the mercy of the virus and world markets or can the provincial government really play a major role in getting the economy back to where it was before this hit now, maybe the metaphor to think about this is that imagine you're in a rowboat, you can steer the boat, you can take it the wrong direction, you can use your oars to get around particular hazards, but the river is going to be taking you. And so I, I think that's a, not a bad way to think about the province is we cannot solve this by ourselves. Uh, we cannot spend our way out of uh, the crisis that we had. We cannot spend our way out of the recession that we're uh, currently in. We're going to rely on the rest of Canada. We're going to rely on our trading partners to all come back. Now, fortunately, we have seen a lot of that. You know, all the, uh, the European Union, China, Japan, all our major trading partners, as well as the other provinces, all took this big hit in uh, March and April, and they've been rebounding. Um, but what we started to see now is a rebound of that COVID. And so then that's going to impact on their economies. It'll impact on our economy. And so that's the struggle that we're having here. That doesn't mean that 
provincial governments don't have any power, but they will be swept by the river, but they can avoid certain hazards. And I think the program that Sean had talked about, that wasn't a lot of money. I think it was in the order of $50 million, but $50 million can get you around some really, really troubling patches. It's, again, it's not, it's not going to solve your problem, Sean, but it will allow you to help solve your problems. And yeah. so those are the kinds of policies that you think of sort of like COVID type policies are probably the kind of policies that make sense for the provincial government simply because, you know, you will be swept and you simply cannot pretend that it's not out there. It seems like what we've been hearing from the party so far are, are ways to get money back into the hands of consumers with the hope that it's going to trickle back through the economy. We're hearing a lot about affordability. We're hearing a lot about tax rebates. I'm wondering, Sean, do you have any confidence that that's going to ultimately help you? Have you heard anything from the party so far that makes you feel like they're listening to your concerns? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I think like anyone in the province, I'm critically concerned about uh, my neighbours and, and making sure that they can pay rent and that they can afford groceries, first and foremost. I, I mean, without a healthy community and without, you know, a, a financially stable community, I, I can't do what I, can, what I do, you know. So it's, it to me, I, I think that's a good lens to look at. Now, do I have confidence that the government's going to give us what we need to, to power through this period? Um, that requires a little bit of unpacking because I, I think entrepreneurs are funny. We're pretty used to not having a lot of support, generally speaking. You know, the, the entire system from an entrepreneur's perspective is one where you need to kind of wedge in and, and slowly make your position in an economy. And so I in leading up to this chat, I talked to a few of my friends in the in the hospitality industry, kind of thinking, well, what do you need? And and to a person, nobody said money. You know, it, it what 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 uh, the hospitality sector needs. I think, um, and, and what my friends think think is clarity around public health orders. I don't. I don't think we should be expecting um, business owners to have to wade into the political debate around things like masks and masks and social distancing. Let's make those decisions and and then allow them to operate. And then regulatory nimbleness. This is a really dynamic period we're going through, and um, there was a lot of really good things at the start of the pandemic that I don't think we should throw out with the bathwater. Things like allowing restaurants to deliver wine to homes with a meal. The world didn't burn down and there's a little bit more return on the restaurant end and a little bit more tax revenue for the province. So these are the sorts of really smart regulatory moves I think you can make. And I, I often take a look at things and maybe it's my background. I take a look at the regulatory framework and I think about how we can make it conducive to growth as opposed to injecting funds. Some sectors will support, but generally speaking, um, sectors need flexibility to operate. So there might be a silver lining to the pandemic in the sense that it showed us that we can do things a little bit differently. I, I think it provoked a why not attitude. Um, you know, whereas we're we're often guilty of of thinking why. I think about the the relaxation around alcohol consumption on patios. You know, it's again we're we're playing catch up with the rest of the world on on the liberalization of a lot of this stuff, and it wasn't a bad thing at the end of the day. So. You know, I, I hope it did reframe. My concern, of course, is always that you we have short memories as a society, the business is normal on a lot of fronts. And, and the hospitality sector is only one small, small slice in that. But it's a general theme that I worry about. Um, there is a lot of learning that can happen. And I think we can imagine a, a different community on the other side of this. And that's what I'd like to see, is vision. In, I as far as we're going to talk about vision, Joel, it, it, it seems like the big picture debate in this election is between austerity and risk and, 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 and sort of an argument that the NDP is proposing a mountain of reckless spending with no plan to balance the budget. And I'm wondering what we know about what approach is more likely to get us out of this hole is an austerity approach that focuses on holding a line on spending in order to balance the budget in four years more likely to get us out of this than a higher spending approach with no plan to balance the budget? Okay, so that's a good question. Of course, I, I, the answer is probably more complicated than I'm going to offer you. <laughs> 
you want to think about two things. One is, what are the immediate needs of the community? And I think Sean has it right. You know, putting money into the broader community and hoping it's going to trickle down to the business owners that are uh, under some pressure probably isn't going to get you very far. Having something a little bit more targeted, so some more targeted spending, uh, in Sean's case, uh, perhaps some rethinking about what those regulations are and let the businesses sort of like work their way out of that. So that's a pol- So those are the kinds of things that I think you need as a response to COVID. In terms of a longer term, it's really about confidence in the economy and the investment that would take place in the economy. We've grown quite rapidly over the last, say, decade and a half because a lot of people have moved to uh, uh, the province. I don't think we're going to get a lot of immigrants uh, taking place this year just because the borders have been closed. But a lot of the people that have immigrated to uh, to Saskatchewan have come from other places in the in the uh, in the country. So some sense of confidence in where Saskatchewan's going in that, you know, that ultimately we're going to have a solution to that problem. So you can see the SAS party is essentially saying, yes, we're going to run big deficits now. That's what you do during a crisis. But we're going to try to come out of that and then balance our budget, say, with it within, a, say, a four year uh, time period. I think the NDP is taking a slightly different approach, which is as a province, we are we are not carrying a very large debt on a per uh, GDP basis. So I think it's 20% of GDP. Um, that's not nominal. That's not a small amount, but it's also something that we can probably finance if we went to a higher level than that. So I don't think the total debt per se would decrease confidence in where the Saskatchewan government is going, but wasting money is never a good thing. So whatever programs, um, are being put forward, you want them to be money well spent. And if it's money well spent, then I think people in Saskatchewan are willing to pay for that. Now, maybe this year's a bad time to pay for it, and I'll put off some of the bills, but maybe next year, the following year, I should pay for that. So this idea that you're gonna balance the budget quickly is I don't think that's a bad idea. I, I, I think any prudent government would think about balancing the budget in the near term, because quite frankly, in 10 years, this can happen again, and we don't want to be in a position where we're even carrying even more debt. So getting to a balanced budget going forward is just, it seems to me it's going to minimize risk in, say, a decade's time. So, you know, let's let's think about the policies that uh, either the parties are, are bringing forward, and uh, if it's a dumb policy, it's dumb, you shouldn't do it. If it's a good policy, um, you know, make sure that it's going to work well and then figure out how to finance that. And, you know, maybe this year's a bad year to finance some of those programs, but I don't see a really long time horizon necessarily in, in terms of financing it. So I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, um, you know, um, I think maybe we want to separate a little bit of uh, the COVID responses from sort of like a longer term economic planning where we're going in, say, three, four years. Got it. Sean, I'm wondering, you, you described yourself to me before as, as something of a nonpartisan voter. You're not necessarily aligned with one party or the other. And I'm wondering, from your perch, uh, are you hearing anything that makes you lean in one direction or the other? I think I'm probably a, a business person, and you got to be nimble when you're a business person. Am, am I hearing anything? Well, I, I think maybe going back to what, what Joel was just talking about, I, I maybe think of things a bit... Um, simplistic in a sense. I think of things from a business perspective. And so when, when you're think, taking a look at spending, um, really the choice when you're dealing with a crisis is to hunker down and cut your expenses and try to weather it out briefly, or to start investing so that you come out the other side and, and you start growing. You know, I, I think, and, and we, so we have a municipal election coming up with um, in Saskatoon as well. And and you, you have kind of a difference, I think, in terms of platforms that talk about investment and vision and kind of structuring out how we're going to continue to grow this thing. And you start, and you also have platforms that talk about what I think of as small potato issues. I don't think that small potato issues are gonna get us through this because it just results in um, government spending, spending for the purpose of keeping our heads down and treading water for a bit and then getting out the other side. I think if we're gonna spend money, we need to really be looking at growth. And, and so, you know, there, there's aspects of both parties, I think, that are that are really appealing. You know, I think investing in infrastructure like education is appealing on, on the NDP side. And I think uh, investing in agriculture on the on the SAS party and their growth plan um, appeals to me as well. Ag is having a great year. Um, we are always, it, you know, saved by agriculture, it seems, in this province. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's we're, our industry, as I mentioned, is an egg value industry. I think if we could really be focused and show some vision in terms of what it means to add value to agriculture in this province, um, we're going to come out the other side of this a couple of years from now with a much more diverse and, and value added economy. And so, you know, I don't know if that, if, if I can necessarily point specifically to one side or the other on that issue, but that's the sort of theme that I'm looking for, as opposed to um, what I would think of as small issue points that are going to score points with voters and, and, and win some votes. I want to see some vision down the chessboard and, and really see some positive change in our province. Joel, I want to focus also as we wrap up here on what I think was one of the big ticket news items of the past week, and that is the wealth tax that we heard uh, proposed through the NDP. And I may be wrong, but I'm relatively certain that that's the first, that would be the first such wealth tax in the entire country. And I'm wondering what we know about how viable that kind of policy is. Um, good question. So first off is this wealth tax is intended to be quite small. Um, so I know $120 million sounds like a lot of money, but we're about an $80 billion economy. The provincial government is $15 billion expenditures. Um, you know, it generates $15 billion worth of taxation. This is a $120 million. It, It's really relatively small potatoes. As an economist, I'm always a little concerned about the damages that a particular tax would generate. It's small, so the damages are going to be all taxes cause damage. This is a small tax. It'll cause some damage. There's some taxes that are particularly bad. Um, I think a wealth tax isn't particularly bad. It does strike me as double taxation. So you're taxed on income, you make an investment, now they want to tax you again on the, uh, uh, you know, so you, when you make an investment, you get taxed on the the uh, accumulations, and now they want to tax you on the stock that you have. That, that that kind of bothers me a little bit, and I'm not quite sure how people would respond to something like that. Um, you know, if I was advising the government, uh, you need more tax money. You got a PST, use a PST, and use the rebates, and and use something very very broad based. That's going to uh, take you know the broader the base, the, the smaller the damage, and so. Um, a wealth tax of this size is unlikely to be particularly either it won't be particularly useful, but it won't be particularly damaging. And Sean, to throw this back at you, I don't know if 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 you're yet in the category that would be covered uh, by this proposed wealth tax. But from your connections in Saskatoon's business community, uh, how do you think people would react to something like that? Both on a political level, and if it ever were to be implemented, do you think it could chase people away? Well, just to, I, I mean, I appreciate this is audio, so I'll very clearly say we are not affected by a wealth tax at Nine Mile Legacy just yet. We hope to be someday. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think that's always the concern. I think there's also, and, and maybe this is something that, that Joel can comment on more than I can, but I think that there are other dynamic ways of raising money right now, um, not the least of which is is uh, cheap financing money. Now, I, I'm not a fan of borrowing money for the sake of borrowing, certainly not for operating costs. But if, if you've got a good investment strategy, that might be a really smart way that a government can um, deal with that sort of thing. That's I'm, I'm not a trained economist, so it's but I but I think that um, what, what I think we need is really creative solutions. And, and to me, um, taxes are going to turn most people off. Uh, generally speaking, I think, um, and that can have some political cost. Whereas creative solutions um, that that leverage the economic situation that we find ourselves in globally um, can be effective. I mean, we're performing very well compared to the rest of Canada, and we're going to continue to perform very well uh, compar comparatively because that's what we do in Saskatchewan. You know, this isn't the first crisis that we've navigated. I, we're all still children of the dirty 30s, you know, and and so we understand how to weather this stuff together. And I think that our our resilience and ingenuity will create really interesting solutions that are probably going to be more palatable to people. Well, I think that's a good uh, positive point to wrap things up on. So I thank both of you, Joel and Sean, for coming on to join us for our uh fourth episode of uh, the Campaniacs podcast. And uh, anybody who wants to follow our coverage uh, of the provincial campaign, go to the starphoenix.com or theleaderpost.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks both. so Thanks. much. Yeah. Thanks, Arthur.